organizations and through experiential learning. Uh, we have worked with the leading organizations across the globe and across industries, and we reach over a lakh learners every year. And our portfolio of offerings can be categorized as leading now and leading next, where the leading now offerings really look at the immediate professional and managerial competencies that would help us perform better in our roles. And leading next talks about the future focused offerings which build a digital mindset and a digital way of working. Uh, and with that, it's now time for us to get to know our panelists a little better. So let me start by welcoming Deepa Krishna, who is the general manager for learning and development at LTI Mantri. And she comes with an experience of over 20 years uh, and has played various roles in HR and she has also led the recruitment team at Mindtree and has designed the employee engagement initiatives and also looked after the DNI portfolio. She's currently an LND, LNOD specialist, and she leads the Behavioral Academy as a part of LND. Uh, she also has a very keen interest in philosophy, practice, and spiritual experience of yoga. Uh, so, Deepa, we are very uh, fortunate to have you with us. Uh, welcome to the session. Thank you very much, Anu. Thanks for this opportunity. And I look forward to having a great conversation with the co-panelists and the audience. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, Deepa. Uh, we also are glad to have with us uh, Siddharth Shishu, who is the senior VP uh, in GenPact. Uh, he is an experienced leader with a demonstrated ability to lead multiple business functions. Uh, and define organizational culture to build high performing global teams, which remain happy and engaged. And in his 20 plus years of work at Genpact, he has worked in high impact leadership roles of PL management, client account leadership, transformation, talent development, mergers and acquisitions, and also building and nurturing high performing teams. Uh, we are very glad to have you with us, Sid. Welcome to the session. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Glad to be here. Thank you, Sid. And last but not the least, we have with us Viju Jess Girao, who is the General Manager for Talent Transformation at Cognizant, and he's joining us from Philippines. And he is a senior leader in the learning and development field and comes with close to 29 years of experience in creating learning solutions for business and education. Uh, his career spans digital skills development, new leader onboarding, succession planning, and industry academy skills pairing. I welcome you to the session, Viju. Glad to be part of it. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you so much. And with that, uh, uh, we now would now move into the panel discussion. And before we do that, just some gu guidelines which we would like all of you to follow is that uh, you know, you will all be on mute for this discussion uh, for all the attendees. We will be opening up the forum for Q&A towards the end. So in case you have any questions, uh, you would see a Q&A panel uh, at the lower bottom of your screen. Please keep typing in your questions and we will come back to them at the end of the session. So let's get started. And uh, well, if you look at the current trends and in the technology and in the ITS industry, um, it indicates that companies now are embracing cloud and service-based IT. Uh, we are also looking at creating supply chains of the future, building a hybrid workforce. And also there is a specific focus on creating a sustainable future. Now, amid all these developments in technology, can emotional intelligence help support or even grow our businesses? That is the premise of our discussion today. And I would now like to throw this discussion open along with our panelists. And let me start with Deepa. So uh, Deepa research now indicates that emotional intelligence and not technology is what will help build the future technology business of, uh, for us. Would you agree with this? We would like to hear your thoughts. 
Yeah. So um, I would not neither agree nor disagree. Okay. So uh, it's like you, the, your title itself says the yin and yang. You know, the world has to coexist. The yin and the yang have to coexist, right? And in Indian, I, I'm also, um, you know, uh, pretty much into Indian history and culture and mythology and all that stuff. If you take the same analogy, right? Mm -hmm. It's also the Shiva and the Shakti, right? Uh, okay. And then comes, uh, you know, if I have to give an analogy, um, if uh, the, you take an example of ocean, right? The ocean has waves. And if you look at waves, uh, changing waves as technology, right? Uh, the beauty is that waves, you know, technology keeps changing and that's what life is all about. And the depth, the deep inside the sea is the emotional intelligence, you know, it can be still and yet very impactful, right? Uh, it is the bottom of the iceberg, they say, right? It, it, you, you cannot see it, but you can... Uh, on, you can only you can't even imagine what kind of an impact it can have on the ocean itself right so it can lead to a tsunami it can lead to anything you know so that's how i see so it's not about this and that it is about coexistence and both have to go hand in hand that's my point of view wow what a lovely way of putting it deepa you know combining it with the waves and the sea and and i think that's what uh, you know what we're really here to see that you know how can that balance be achieved between our growth and also making sure that the right eq can be used at the right time exactly. so thanks for your perspective there Thank you. and uh, sid i would like to maybe uh, just move to you also and ask you uh, you know in addition to what we've just heard from deepa right what is your take on the importance of emotional intelligence um, in building any technology organization in the future. You're quite excited about uh, talking about something I passionately believe in as, as a leader. And I think um, I personally feel the innovation for the future is driven predominantly because if you uh, value creativity and, and, and a level of uh, autonomy in your jobs, mm -hmm. uh, right? So... Uh, if you look at all the companies that are really at the cutting edge of technology or innovation, there's a yeah. cultural element which is driving that innovation bottoms up. Like if you look at Google, for example, uh, they have they embrace the element of entrepreneurship within the organization where teams can build their own products and it fails. And it re relates to what I call, and I've, uh, I, I think there's a lot of focus on is your organization failure proof or are you failure tolerant? Absolutely. And if your organization culturally is not failure tolerant, uh, you would not be able to encourage more innovation because innovation means failing fast, failing and, and learning from it quickly and then moving to the next uh, experiment. So yeah. I personally feel uh, it all rel relies entirely on the culture, which is largely driven by the fact that emotions play a part and how you engage, how you energize the organization and allow them to be autonomous and, and flex their muscles without having to worry about the Im impact of failure. And therefore, em emotional uh, literacy, if I call it, if not emotional yeah. intelligence, is essential for future innovation because nowadays 20-year-olds are innovating like crazy and uh, you need to give them that space in the organization. Absolutely. A wonderful thought, Sid. And, you know, that reminds me, uh, you know, of uh, when Satya Nadella joined, uh, you know, uh, Microsoft, he took over in 2014. Uh, at that time, the culture of the company was quite toxic. And, you know, he's actually come forward and said that he used empathy as a tool to change the company's culture over time. And he said that, Empathy has been, you know, a foundation for driving innovation and growth at Microsoft. So I think, uh, you know, I can clearly connect where you're coming from that, uh, you know, as a culture, how do you make sure that EI uh, is embedded in the culture of an organization uh, to take ahead? So thanks for sharing your thoughts. Yeah. So, um, so we've heard Deepa, we've heard Sid on their take. I would now like to maybe um, also check with uh, Viju. 
Um, you know, we are talking about a balance of AI technology. Um, a very important aspect of emotional intelligence is also the tenant of creating a psychological safety for your uh, for the people around you, right? So I want to check with you. Uh, you know, do you feel that a higher EQ with you know sufficient psychological safety being created for people? Uh, do you feel that would actually result in a culture of innovation and growth? What's your take on that? The, the quick answer to that is, is a huge yes, but uh, it's more complex than just saying, yes, let's put that in, and then op actually operationalizing that. Uh, mm -hmm. Sid started the, the whole conversation and ended it with, you, you have to have these 20 year olds have some space and have their sandbox and take care of what it is that they need. And I think that's where we're coming from uh, as an IT company. I'd, I'd like to believe that the 20 year, 30 year olds who are the bulk of our employee base have a lot of options in front of them. And why would they want to work with us? And gone are the days that we would probably say, uh, look, we have a lot of options openings come in through the door and join the culture that we have right now mm -hmm. uh, versus what we're going to be doing right now, which is to cater to their self-expression. And I think I'm a big, 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 big fan of that, that if an organization starts thinking along the lines of uh, getting people through the door and letting them go through a particular company culture module and telling them this is how we're going to do things, I don't think we're going to be getting a lot of people through the door. We're going to have to live with the fact that a lot of the people are looking for self-expression in their work. Yeah. We're going to have to live with the fact that people are going to end up, if their self-expression is not fulfilled, it will lead to isolation. It will lead to unfulfilled needs at work. Hmm. Uh, and I think people should go beyond just compensate. Uh, you know, it's not a race for who has the biggest compensation. It's not a race for who has the nicest uh, you know, benefits and packages. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people stay in the job because, and I've heard a lot of this happen lately. They stay in the job because I like it. I be, I'm able to express myself. The company is able to amplify my projects, amplify my thought process. and. I think the company needs to stop looking at making people emotionally intelligent, but be emotionally intelligent themselves so that when people come through the door, the assumption is they're not mature enough to be emotionally intelligent and to live with that fact instead of moaning about the process that they're going to stay or not stay mm -hmm. and then pull, uh, pull their hair and say, I think people are not mature enough. I think we just have to accept the fact that we need to compete with a lot of options and we're just one of those options. And if we don't change the way we think, mm -hmm. we're going to lose a lot of the great minds that are out there. Absolutely. I think um, a very well said point, Viju. Thanks for that. And I think uh, one thing which I can really get an indication from what you just said is that I think technology is going to be something which is going to be replicated across places, across companies. But I think EI is what the differentiator is going to be, uh, you know, for the future. How do we get differentiate ourselves as companies and organizations from our competitors? So, uh, so thank you so much. I think that makes a lot of sense. And um, I also appreciate the point you said about, you know, the new people joining in and, you know, not, uh, you know, making it f uh, felt that, okay, everyone needs a training on EI, right? Uh, we are also looking at people who are emotionally mature, uh, you know, despite their age and uh, despite their experience as well. So thanks for that. So uh, as we all have seen, and, you know, we've been reading in news, uh, you know, uh, recently that uh, specifically with the ITES industry, there are multiple layoffs, you know, there are multiple um, areas where, uh, you know, uh, you know, mass resignations have also shaken up the industry. So Sid, I would just maybe like to understand, uh, you know, your take on, do you feel that there is a role that uh, emotional leadership can play in these times, you know, because things are uncertain, people are shaken up. Um, what's your view? Um, first of all, I think um, companies are here to make money. So let's be very clear. Uh, this is not a charitable organization or these are not NGOs that they have a purpose focused on employee 
uh, retention and stuff. They have to make money. They have to be able to fund for their salaries and be able to be continue to do better things for employees. So there will be business cycles where companies have to take tough calls for themselves yeah. to stay and survive in this uh, very volatile, uncertain environment. Mm -hmm. So there are calls, and I'm sure none of the news that you would have heard are all very difficult decisions for the leadership of the organization. Uh, I can imagine the pain uh, that any leader will come through when he has to give the pink slips. So I want to make sure we all understand it. Uh, today, I am on this side of the table. Tomorrow, I could be on the other side of the table, depending on how the business runs. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, I think, uh, you know, um, this is a cycle that I've seen like 20 years. Every turn downturn, you will see uh, these huge waves of layoffs in the tech, tech companies. It's very common in the US. They're kind of used to it. India generally hasn't seen as much because we've been growing at a much faster rate. There's enough for people to do and, and you anyways lose a lot of people. So you tend to not necessarily count them as layoffs. Uh, but the reality is that eventually uh, the manager who's the immediate manager needs to play a very important part. I always believe the immediate manager is the organization for that employee who's affected. Uh, yeah. It's not the CEO, it's not the CFO, it's not the press release, it's not, it's what the manager did in that situation and how did he handle the situation. And I think there is a lot of effort that at least at GenPact, I can tell you, but we, we don't have any formal layoffs. We're doing really well. We are growing at a certain speed and, and, and therefore there's enough to, for people to do and move around. The challenge part is now, whether the people want to move around as much, uh, given the post-pandemic challenges. Uh, they want to stay in their hometowns and they want to do what they want to do. And therefore, we still have open positions for people who possibly are get, coming through a, a rough patch because of a client uh, organization deciding to cut down budgets, uh, right. particularly in the services side. So from our perspective, I, we are very clear that we will give them enough opportunities within the company uh, eventually it's, it's for two to tango, uh, to be able to say, yes, I want to take this opportunity for my betterment. Uh, at the same time, we are very careful, extremely careful. Um, sometimes I get worked up that fact that we are over cautious about how you handle the conversation. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it takes much longer for us to prep ourselves and the conversation might be just 30 minutes, but mm -hmm. it probably will take three days for us to just reconcile to the fact that we have to take this tough call on someone. So I think there is there is very clear uh, focus, at least from my experiences, on making sure it's easier for the employee. So we provide a lot of support uh, wherever people have been asked to leave because of performance issues or otherwise. Mm -hmm. But I personally think there is so much that we can do much better in our organization. There is so much the industry can do a lot more with helping each other out. I see a lot of support coming through personal posts on your LinkedIn and people say, I am looking for a job. Can somebody spread my message? I think as an industry, we need to do a lot more to help each other because this is the time for getting together and taking care of the workforce that really does wonders for us in the, in the upsides that we have. Uh, and therefore, uh, playing with your heart and as I say, you know, typical heart leadership is very important in these environments. This is the time for over communication, uh, softer hands um, and behaving much more maturely and handling them with care. Yeah. Wow. Uh, thanks for that, Sid. Uh, and I see how you have connected this back with what we started is the entire cre uh, culture being created and over, you know, an entire organization where we say that, how do you manage these situations? We don't get overboard with the sensitivity part, but we also make sure people are comfortable and, you know, uh, whatever is happening does not hamper their productivity. Excellent. So, um, so while we've seen this part of the industry where layoffs are happening, uh, you know, things are shaking up, there's another part which organizations are very cautious of, and that is how do you get a hybrid workforce to function normally? You know, what do we do with a dispersed workforce? That's another key element, which I think a lot of organizations are really looking at. Um, Deepa, I would like to hear your view on, you know, do you feel that managers and leaders with a higher emotional quotient can deal with such a hybrid environment better? What's your view? Yes. 
these are challenging times for the managers definitely because uh, you know your teams do not want to come back to office and they are asking for a very logical reason for uh, coming back to office and you can't just throw a card that you know we want you to collaborate you know because they have learned the ways of collaboration in in the hybrid model and also what happens is um, you know covid changed the whole way of uh, life itself you know so um, today, a, a youngster has realized that, you know, I can sit in my hometown and I can do a lot of things. You know, I can pursue a hobby. I can take care of my uh, aging parents. I can do a little bit of farming if needed. And then I can also do an IT job, you know. So that's kind, yeah. uh, you know, life, uh, the, uh, uh, what, what do you say, the landscape, you know, the canvas has just widened uh, for people you know and i think that's when um, compassion and empathy and ability to connect with people uh, taking the initiative to connect with people see when you, when people come to office you have no choice but you know you you say a hello you go for a cup of coffee uh, it, 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 there is a setup there you know to network and communicate with each other but here if i'm not taking the initiative i don't the communication does not happen. I have to ping people on Teams, and that is another uh, decision. You know, is it the right time to ping them? Uh, should I call them, or should I call them on Teams, or should I call them on phone? All these things run in your mind. Whereas in the office, you just bump into someone in the corridor and you start chatting, right? So, with all these things, um, you know, uh, hy hybrid model gives that advantage. You know, I, I come to office. I network with people, I, uh, I uh, socialize with the community, and then I go back, uh, you know, I, I also work from home so that I can balance my work and life a little better, okay? In that context, I think uh, the leaders will ha have to be a little more open, uh, embrace technology for collaboration, uh, take the initiative to connect with people, and uh, this is here, going to stay here. This is, hybrid model is not going to go away. Uh, the youngsters have started their career in, in a remote working mode. And the next mode that they're seeing is hybrid model. It's not going to go away. You know, it's going to stay and better develop compassion, empathy, and connectivity with people, your ability to connect with people. Absolutely. Um, you know, thanks for, uh, you know, sharing your thoughts on that, Deepa. And uh, as a company, I do understand and that you know at LTI Mindtree there are so many initiatives that you are taking to enhance this uh, level of awareness in your employees on EQ and being more empathetic in dealing with such situations so uh, would you like to share with the group about some of these practices and interventions uh, you know which are running successfully yeah so definitely it's not just uh, our organization uh, uh, entire industry tried a lot of things in the last two, three years, you know. So COVID triggered it, you know. Suddenly, uh, IT companies were talking about wellness, mental health. Uh, there were, you know, there were topics people would stay shy away from discussing, you know, uh, depression, all these people never uh, talked about, you know. So uh, even if you look at uh, certain reports today, there is a, a report that says that uh, a lot of people in India, Indians are more stressed than rest of the world, people in the rest of the world. You know, why is that so? Uh, so um, uh, I, I think, um, uh, you know, organizations realize that uh, there has to be an effort put in this direction and uh, uh, psychological safety as you rightly brought it up last uh, in, in the previous question so create that psychological safety psychological safety does not mean that you know your job is safe uh, even if you do not perform psychological safety means that you have a support system right if you have a problem there's something buddy somebody and and there's a policy or a framework that you can look at and reach out to you know, so um, you know some of the programs that we um, uh, launched uh, during uh, post-COVID is uh, definitely focused on uh, mindfulness. Okay, and uh, for the youngsters, we focused primarily on emotional balance. That is, you know, they went through that um, COVID situation. A lot of people lost uh, their close ones. Uh, you know, they were sitting in their PGs or you know one room and operating. Uh, stress and depression, loneliness had created havoc. So we focused on emotional balance uh, 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 as part of the mindfulness umbrella. 
And the second one was resilience. Now, resilience is key for leaders, you know, managers and above. Yeah. If they are not resilient, they cannot deal with or navigate through the change uh, that is hitting them like waves. You know, yeah. one is technology change, then people leaving, great resignations happen, layoffs happen. What do you deal with? Yeah. And every time it is this layer, manager and above that gets stuck, you know, yeah. that gets caught in this um, uh, turmoil, you know, so they are the most tested. So it's better that they build the resilience and grit to uh, deal with this, uh, these situations. So resilience uh, was another, uh, uh, resilient leader was another program that we introduced, being a le resilient leader. Excellent. Uh, and Deepa, that, uh, you know, that's very relevant. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of us are hearing that and trying to see how we can do the similar, you know, practices in our industry. And one thing it clearly brings out is that, you know, maybe pre-COVID, you know, the need was always there. But I think the realization of things like stress, mindfulness being really important uh, in the way of working has now really taken shape. So thanks for pointing it, uh, you know, that's definitely crucial and um, it is definitely uh, related to emotional intelligence, right? Because if I'm able to focus, I am not worried about what's happening in my industry, in my company. That's the only way I can be productive in my job. Yeah. yeah so thanks for sharing. Um, Viju, I am aware there are a lot of such initiatives uh, you are taking at Cognizant as well. In fact, uh, you know, when you started, you did speak about, uh, you know, operationalizing self-expression. Would you like to maybe elaborate that and talk about some of the initiatives you are taking? Sure. It's a really tough, tough time for people in their 20s and 30s when they shift to an environment that is very structured, very formal, people using corporate talk, <laughs> and it's not cool. Um, it's not as cool as social media. It's not as cool as going out with my friends, especially here in the Philippines, people love fun. Uh, and then you bring them to an environment where the walls are black and white. So one of the things that we wanted people to have was something that would make them connect with, with each other. Like in our case, we, we would have a Friday night uh, get together virtual. Okay. It's open for everybody to link to. We call it learn and earn, where people actually just shared what their personal projects are. So we would have a guest who would be volunteering, talking about their learning, uh, what their learnings are. And it's not even learning within the company. It could even be learning outside of the company. Uh, one person talked about how to intubate a person who is having a, a problem with breathing because he's a nurse. Another person, totally not, not related to the last conversation, talked about how to perform a musical number online. Mm -hmm. uh, another person wanted to talk about uh, how, to, how, to do, how to make TikTok happen in the office. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Like, can we have some TikTok stations around the company where it's TikTok safe? Um, so how cool should the company get, <laughs> right? Uh, apparently, that's not something that corporate should discuss. That's something organic. That's something that's created from bottom up. Mm. And that, that, that organic creation of it, we call it learn and earn. Uh, and that was something that impacted the, the offerings, the design, and the delivery of what we're doing. We've yeah. also stopped thinking about having people in, enroll in courses and forcing force feeding courses on them and telling them, hey, every person who is of this position will have to take this course. I don't think there's a, there should be one single course that every person should take by virtue of them being a particular position. Uh, I call it the Netflix of learning right, the hyper-personalization of learning. And what we did was, we did what we call a, a learning influencer in, uh, group, mm -hmm. where we made sure that we follow something sort of like the Starbucks model, where they don't really care who their detractors are. Starbucks doesn't even care if they have the best coffee. Uh, Starbucks doesn't even care if you entered there just because you wanted to hang out and be cool. What is important is that when you enter, you get absolutely ridiculously great customer service. And that's what we tried to do. Anyone who consumed our content, attended our classes, told people about how great it is to learn new skills. We spoiled them no end. 
we gave them we gave them points that they could convert into something that they could buy outside. We gave them jackets. We gave them memorabilia. It it meant it means nothing maybe at the surface, but you know how this generation is about immediate gratification, about having certain things be felt right there and then. You don't want to delay, you know. The, the reward at the end of the year, which is traditionally the model for HR. You do well, we'll give you a great performance review at the end of the day. They, do, they, they, they care about the here and the now. Yeah. So I did something cool. What do I get for it? Oh, here's a nice uh, piece of, here's a, here's a nice piece of device that you can use. It's really, it's actually just something as cheap as uh, a logo, an insignia that you can put in your lanyard. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, so what did we what did we learn from this entire thing? That the learning influencers are the one that's driving people towards our content. Yeah. We learn a lot of things from the young ones. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I wish that I wish I could take credit for everything that I'm talking about right now, but all the things that I'm talking about are are derived from hours and hours of painstakingly listening to those people who are barely heard in corporate boardroom conversations, where we wrap our brains about what kind of training programs would people want to attend? Why don't we just make sure that, what, did we try to even listen to them in the first place? Or are you complaining about the fact that nowadays the youth of the day are not so interested about Lean and Six Sigma training no. uh, and complaining about why they're not into quality analysis, analysis and the basics of financials? Uh, maybe they will have that appetite, but it's like, a, it's a cycle, right? I mean. First, you get them interested in the surface, give them comic books first before they learn to read the novel, uh, and not complain that people are not mature enough. I think that's what I've been learning for the past few years, that the transition to making the workplace be more responsive to what is happening outside of the workplace, then it becomes a joy. It doesn't become something that's a push. I think the training should catch up on that. And not, not, I'm not saying we should do away with all the traditional program. There's, there's the pull and there's the push of training. Mm -hmm. Pull, the push training is just BAU, but the pull training is something else. And I think that's what makes people want to go to work every day. If the company that they are joining is amplifying their, their voice. We got a lot of LGBTQ in our group. We have a bunch of people who love dancing. We have a bunch of people who like using the bike. If they go to a job that says, hey, we know what you're into and we know you're more than just what you do every day. They like what they see. They like what they hear. And that's what I think what we'll do to get top talent. I don't know if that made sense, but that's one of the things that we're trying to do and we're still figuring it out. I don't think it's going to be a period on everything here's how it's here's the magic formula yeah. no we're still getting the data it's too early and it just keeps on evolving as we go through yeah um a lovely thought Biju. thanks for sharing uh you know and, and i like the fact that uh you know you you said that we're picking this up and we're learning as we uh you know progress and we're learning from some of the young people in the team right um and i think a very important part which you mentioned and which we haven't touched upon yet is uh, when we say EQ, right, we have been talking about EQ with your employees as leaders, but a very important part is not to let go of the fact that your customers are your key people where you need to also, uh, you know, uh, enhance your emotional conversations with them because in the snap of your, uh, you know, fingers, they're ready to maybe go to your competitors if they are not happy, if they don't feel uh, that they are being serviced in the right manner. So uh, Sid, I would maybe like to ask, what's your view when it comes to, um, you know, as a culture of being emotionally intelligent, right? Uh, do you feel that the, uh, especially the tech organizations need to start doing something differently to serve their customers better? Well, what's your view on that? Well, it's an ongoing journey. Um, you know, I've been in the outsourcing industry for 20 plus years. I can tell you that customer needs are evolving every year. Um, it's a typical uh, model where wants become needs over time. And 
we need to be ahead of that curve. Otherwise, you will feel there is gap in expectation um, because suddenly your wants have become needs. Um, so from our perspective, obviously, uh, customer experience is core to our business from Genpack's perspective. Uh, we love to be in their shoes most of the times. Uh, at the same time, we hate to lose uh, business to our competition. Uh, mm -hmm. Nobody won't like to do that ever. And I think I feel proud about the team that we've never lost uh, something uh, because of our ability to manage the relationship. Uh, we, we've lost some predominantly because there's a cost pressure or there is an element of location strategy change or, or overall company strategy changes. Uh, I think we, what we generally do for a lot of our new people that come into the system is to role play a lot of work uh, with respect to how do you handle conflict? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you handle negotiations? How do you handle uh, uh, difficult customer relationships? Uh, you know, your typical call center environment. Uh, you know, I have been on the other side sometimes and I have you be on the other side sometimes that we are not happy with something and we keep shouting at the same guy, but no fault of his, right? Yeah. Uh, but reality is that he has to remain cool and still say, I'm sorry for what I have, what has happened and I'll come back to you with a resolution and blah, blah, blah. So there's a lot of uh, mental balance and um, uh, you know emotional stability that's needed in handling a situation, which is yeah. very important. So situational leadership, specifically for mental management, becomes very important. And now that with, with the pressure that's on to our customers uh, is huge. You mm -hmm. know, we are feeling it on, on not as first hand, but second hand. Re reality is that there's pressure on margins, there's pressure on inflation, there's pressure of material costs, there is pressure on the company that we serve for them to do better in this market space. So naturally the pressure needs to go to the suppliers too. Mm -hmm. Right, we are the ecosystem within which we operate. They depend on us. We depend on them. It's it is a win-win, and therefore, if they lose, we lose. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a, a lot of effort in order to be able to be in their shoes. Uh, listening becomes very important. Yes. Still, listening becomes very important. Mm -hmm. uh, not being able to necessarily judge a situation by whether he is tough or not, and actually be able to look at the problem. Uh, away from the person mm -hmm. and, and, and solve for the problem rather than solve for the person uh, becomes very important. So there are there, these are ongoing day-to-day -day ch challenges that operating teams work in, in a services environment. And it's not getting easier. It's yeah. not at all getting easier. So therefore, as you rightly said, it becomes critical for us to continue to focus on softer elements of running the business uh, than just delivering a technical solution but also being able to be understanding the customer mindset and how uh, you influence his success or her success. So lots to do there, honestly. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for sharing your views there, Sid. Uh, you know, um, I, I think, yes, it's, it's a journey, like you said, we are taking, but there's still a long way to go. In fact, uh, you know, there was a recent uh, research uh, by the Society for Information Management's IT trend study. And what they said is that, you know, um, while we have so much of technology force available, uh, young people available, but, uh, you know, there is a gap when it comes, and there's a very high demand, demand for technology professionals who are able to bridge this communication channel between their business and the outside world, you know, their consumers, their vendors, their suppliers. So, um, which again brings to the light the fact that, you know, people may be joining us with the right mindset, the right IQ, but somewhere the organizations, you know, have to take the onus of grooming them uh, into becoming uh, the right people to serve their customers better, right? And that's where the component of emotional quotient really, uh, you know, gets into the focus. So uh, thank you. I think that's a great fact and a great, uh, you know, way of looking at it as well. Um, so as we are now coming at the last juncture of our panel discussion, um, I would maybe like to uh, maybe hear from everyone and, and maybe let's start with Deepa on her views, um, you know, in terms of, you know, we have seen and we are hearing everyone talking about how this balance is required, the yin and yang of technology uh, with emotional intelligence is so important. Um, 
what is uh, you know what is your feeling that you know as we are entering the era of smart machines uh, robotics ai uh, do you think in the future you know organizations will increasingly seek more emotionally intelligent leaders yes that will be the reality new reality you know so uh, you may have uh, um, you know a lot of automation happening in the industry um, you may have uh, ai and uh, you know the uh, uh, metaverse technology or the ar augment uh, ar vr technologies all this uh, will definitely um, you know will be um, getting uh, more prominence as we move forward um, and this will also uh, see at the end of the day whatever technology uh, you know we could be working on uh, it is human beings who create that right and uh, without our knowledge we may create something that may be that may be you know in future not so good for us you know we may have to deal with it you know so technology is like that right you know in in colleges if you uh, have attended the group discussions uh, one of the most popular topic was is technology a boon or a bane okay and people would have their views on it right so we we could be creating something that can you know not be not so uh, good for the humanity also right so we have to learn to deal with all these things you know so the the more and more we progress uh, philosophically if i have to look at uh, more and more we progress the challenges also will be proportionally increasing you know and definitely people being at the core of everything we are, especially our industry it is people our assets are people right and they come uh, you know not just in as a physical body into your office premise they come with all their emotions feelings they walk into the premise and you know uh, there could be negativity there could be a lot of things that um, leaders have to deal with okay Absolutely. and that's the reason i also see that in the last one one and a half years there's a lot of talk happening around compassionate leadership uh, empathetic leadership you know why are we talking about all these things because this is all leading to that you know all the changes that we are noticing the technology evolution happening so rapidly this will all require people to deal with things very differently maturely have a broader perspective uh, look at people as human beings holistically absolutely. you know all that will be expected yeah absolutely and and thanks for sharing that uh, you know the importance of uh, you know balancing the machines with the human element definitely is the key deepa thanks for sharing that um and we joe if if i was to maybe just ask you you know for the sake of the uh, audience who is here right um if if you were to guide us that okay to achieve this balance between eq and technology there could be the best practices that you would encourage all of us to do uh, what would they be i i'm a big big fan of people knowing how to connect with the digital dots okay um, I don't think anyone. This is what I would be telling people who attend our design thinking courses, where they are told to just be creative. You can't just tell people be creative and then don't give them guidelines on how to be creative. Um, and we, I did tell them that you can start small and build on the creativity of other people, and then try to see how you can apply that by connecting with something that you have. I'll give you an example right now. Like, it's so cliche. for us to do online meetings with some people doing video in front of uh, the laptop and then some people doing meetings in the room that that could be absolutely improved by stopping and talking about that and getting our digital knowledge in the entire mix and saying hey why don't we have motion detecting cameras so that the person who's speaking in the room can move around freely and not just be sitting in my chair right now i there's a training going on in the other room where we have a multi camera setup that has to follow the trainer in the room and take a look at and panning around participants so that the online participants can actually have that feel of what's happening in the room yeah. and not just make it be nice for people who are in the room but at the same time the people in the room should not be obligated to switch on their cameras when they can see the person very much inside the room 
I'm talking about making use of what's already there. Now, some of our young people and even the people who are at the management level will talk about digital transformation all they want the entire day and miss the point because they're not even utilizing half of what they already have. They can't put it together. So I guess one of the best apl applications of emotional intelligence is understanding how pe each person feels. And that is a tough, tough nut to crack because people don't understand how people feel at the customer level, yeah. internal customers included. They don't understand that people are bored. They don't understand that people are looking at it as a cliche. They don't understand that people want to have some bit of variety mm -hmm. and they can't go beyond what's, be, what's you know beyond their nose because they're just looking at the entire churn of it. So one great practice to make do with what you have, connect the digital dots that you can see, expand that, expand the connection of the dots as you go along and uh, don't sweat it that you're not the most genius person in the planet. Start small, but execute well. And that's a really great practice to do, to, to control your emotional intelligence. Yeah. I think that's a practical step in the right direction. Thanks, uh, Viju. And I think uh, the one line I'm going to take away from what you just said is connect the digital dots by understanding how people feel, right? I, I think that's yep. where we are intending to have a balance on both. So thank you so much for that. Um, Sid, any closing comments on uh, your thoughts on, you know, what, how can we achieve this balance between the yin and yang? Uh, what would be your closing thoughts for the audience? I think just uh, quickly running through the summary, I think the element of... Um, Acknowledging that uh, you need to lead by heart is, is an important element of uh, a pivot that leadership has to make. Uh, yeah. We still struggle with it, by the way. A uh, classic example I give people is the fact that pre-COVID or at the time of COVID, every company said we will do 100% home, virtual, for a work from anywhere, work from whatever. And then suddenly in the middle of this year, now suddenly companies are pivoting to saying, I want three days in office. I want four days in office. So I think the consistency of how you operate and that is the emotional uh, thought process, which is to how do you deal with situations when you don't know the answer. Uh, and, and the best thing to do in this situation is to have active listening skills. What does the employee want? Uh, it's not what I think is the right thing because I'm too old now probably to even realize how the Gen X or Gen Ys think, right? So I need to rather go out and balance myself a little bit and uh, be mature about the fact that I don't know everything. I don't need to know everything. Absolutely. And that's a challenge for the leadership of the future uh, of how do you continue to uh, pivot yourself. Uh, Self-compassion uh, is important and they for in order to have the survival instincts of being continued to be a big leader in the organizations, we got to continuously be able to pivot and uh, listen in, listen in a lot more uh, and pivot quickly. Yeah, thank you so much, Sid. Uh, that's interesting, you know, and I think it's all going back to the basics is, is what I really take back from you, right? Those proper listening skills, being, being compassionate with the people around you. And it has been a great conversation so far. Uh, you know, I must say, um, uh, I can't believe we're at the end of the clock right now. And I think it's only fair for us to throw this open uh, for some questions is from the attendees. Uh, they have been very patient. And I'm sure that some of us have uh, questions that they would like to um, ask the panelists. So I would now request all our attendees to maybe drop in their questions in the Q&A panel. And, uh, we will definitely, uh, you know, answer some of them. Okay, so till the time we have some questions, uh, you know, maybe coming in uh, from the audience. Uh, I think uh, since we're also almost at the end of time, for the sake of everyone, I see some people joined us in the middle of the discussion as well. 
I would like to maybe, you know, jump into what we have really discussed today and what is the essence of our conversation, right? So uh, to lay the foundation of a future in the tech industry, right? We're really looking at how can we receive a balance between emotional intelligence and creating uh, you know, technology for the future, which is full of innovation, which is full of growth for the business. And we're looking at you know, balancing the new uh, you know, technology uh, advances like cloud technology. We're looking at uh, you know, ZAS services with uh, the softer elements of say, being able to be compassionate, listening, uh, intently collaborating well with people. And that's the focus you know, which is going to build momentum uh, to create a sustainable, uh, you know, future for us. So, um, so thank you to all the panelists. We have one question from the audience, uh, from Rohan, who says, um, "Does any of the organizations represented here uh, measure employee EQ during hiring, especially at leadership level? And if yes, can you share more?" So, I'm just going to throw this open to any of the panelists if uh, they have something they would like to comment on that. I, I'll do a quick answer and say we don't have a psychometric test mm -hmm. that would test people's emotional intelligence. And I don't think it would be a fair basis for making for making decisions on a person's emotional maturity. Mm -hmm. I don't think there is enough maturity in the testing system for people's EQ. Uh, we more or less base our decision on scenario-based uh, questions and their answers to those scenario-based questions usually give us an indication of future success based on past performances. So I hope from our organization, that's how, how, how it works. Yeah. Thanks. Large, just... Largely, I know, I don't think any uh, organizations, given the kind of growth IT industry has had, uh, right, uh, very rapidly, uh, you know, it grew. So I, I don't think anybody's uh, really investing in um, assessing emotional intelligence specifically. It's all uh, a very overall uh, observations made during uh, interview process. Uh, that's what we rely upon. But there are organizations that have assessment centers, which uh, does uh, a couple of psychometric assessments for career growth, you know, career progression. Um, and uh, you know, Army uses this assessments a lot, you know, and they use that very extensively. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think they consider it a big failure if they have a guy who is who has even slightest suicidal tendency. They consider it the biggest uh, failure, you know. And somewhere we have to get there, you know, we have to get to that direction and invest a little in assessments. But given the speed that we deal with, you know, today change and speed are two keywords in the industry. Given that, uh, we keep postponing investing in these kind of assessments, yeah. mostly in the industry. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's fair, Deepa. And I think. Um... Uh, so prominently, predominantly, our recruitment system currently looks at hiring on the basis of IQ, right? Our interviews, our tests are all maybe uh, gathered around that. And I think it's a good um, way to for us all to reflect that. Would it be, would it make sense to maybe add this component of emotional quotient uh, to also measure this, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, this aspect for a candidate, it does, right? It, uh, does, it does definitely at senior leadership level. Uh, you know, all said and done, walk the talk, you know. So uh, for senior leadership, um, you know, it should be introduced. Yeah, absolutely. Because they are um, also the influencers, right? Uh, they also influence people a lot. Uh, people, processes, policies, everything they are influencing, right? So it should be assessed. Absolutely. Uh, I hope, Rohan, that did answer the question uh, you were looking at. Uh, it looks like Sid has disconnected uh, and we are almost at the top of the time today. Um, so uh, we have, uh, I believe, one more question. No, that's Rohan. Uh, you're most welcome, Rohan. Um, so I would like to maybe thank uh, all our attendees for joining this webinar. I hope this was fruitful for all of us and we can 
take some of this back for us to implement back at our workplaces. And I would also like to thank um, Deepa and Viju for their time, as well as Sid who has disconnected now, but thank you so much for sparing your valuable time and being with us today. Um, this was really engaging uh, and I'm sure everyone has learned so much from the experience that you have shared with us. Thank you everyone for joining in. Um, wish you all the best, uh, take care and Let's hope to connect again at a future knowledge session uh, by Norscape. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Anu. Thank you, audience. Thanks Thank for the opportunity. Good day, everyone. See you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.